This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. I was glad when he said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. For God has shown thee what is good. And what does the Lord require of thee but to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. Good morning. We welcome you this morning to the Andrew Rankin Memorial Chapel. And we pray God's blessings upon you as we seek to worship our God in spirit and in truth. This morning, we are indeed blessed to hear a message from one of our nation's leading pastors and preachers, the Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley. He is the senior pastor of the Alfred Street Baptist Church, Alexandria, Virginia. Pray for him as he comes to bring us a word from the Lord. This week's scripture comes from Romans chapter 13, verses eight through 10, and it reads, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. This is the word of God, for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
prepare our hearts and minds for prayer, let us be still before our God. When I consider the heavens, the moon and the stars that you have ordained, and then when I think about my own little life, I ask you, O oh God, what is it about me? What is it about us all that makes you so mindful? You are better to us than we could ever be to ourselves. You've asked us, Lord, not to be anxious, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, to present our request to you. And you said your peace, your peace which transcends all understanding, will guard our hearts in our minds in Christ Jesus. You promised us your peace. A peace that goes beyond anything that we could ever imagine. And so we give to you now all that is within us that seeks to rob us of that peace and what we, in our weaknesses, cannot surrender. We ask that you take it from us, Lord. Take from us every fear, every desire, and every impulse that's getting in the way of our peace. Give to us now that, that perfect peace, that peace that will make our souls well, no matter what we may be going through. God, our minds, Lord, protect us from ourselves. Protect us from, from thoughts, from words, from, from memories that cause us to doubt ourselves and to settle for lesser things. God, our minds from letting others define us and limiting our possibilities. Make us to know, Lord. Make us to know and to understand that you are a healer more than you are a judge. Make us to know. Make us to know even now that, that we can be healed. We can be changed. And our tomorrows will be better than our yesterdays. God, our hearts, Lord, protect us. Protect us from feelings of loneliness, from fears of rejection, from feelings that make us afraid. God, our hearts, Guard our hearts so that we will not be wounded by what others say and think about us or tempted to protect ourselves by becoming someone we are not. Guard our hearts this morning. Guard our hearts so that hatred, jealousy, and fear will be denied access. And only what will be touched by love will enter. And then, O oh Lord, we, we know that you asked us to pray with thanksgiving. And we thank you for all that you have already provided. Things that we 
too often take for granted, especially the gift of being alive. Even amid a pandemic, amid so much that is wrong, give to us grateful hearts. Open the eyes of our hearts to see all the good that is already in our lives. Then help us, oh God, to think about these things rather than what we think about. Things that are not good. Situations that are past. Circumstances that we cannot change. Make us Make us not to be afraid of what tomorrow might bring. Help us to surrender our tomorrows to you, trusting you, believing that you will take care of us. Give us the courage, Lord. Give us the audacity to believe, to, to give thanks now for what tomorrow will bring. When justice will roll down like water, and righteousness like a mighty stream. When we'll cease to talk about the left and the right and more about what is right and what is wrong. Help us now to give thanks for what will happen when this nation, our sick nation, will be healed. We give you now all who are hurting this morning. We give to you now all who need healing. Come now, Lord, and heal us. Come to our secret places, the places too sensitive for human words to touch or human hands to touch. Come now, Lord, and we give to you our poor, we give to you all who are walking with grief. And we give to you now this nation. This nation, Lord, whose children have become collateral damage in a culture of violence and greed. Come now, Lord, and heal us. We're not going to try to tell you how to fix these things this morning. We're just going to let go now. And we're going to trust you. We're just going to trust you. Hold us now. Hold us in your love until we learn how to love. Drop now thy still dues of quietness until all our striving cease. Take, Lord, from our souls the strain and the stress and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Beloved, grace and peace be unto you from God who loves us as a father and a mother and Jesus Christ who is our resurrected, risen, reigning, returning Redeemer. Howard University, the real HU. I am excited, grateful, and thankful for the opportunity to participate in our time of worship. As always, I want to recognize our beloved Dean, Dean Richardson, and thank you so much not only for the invitation, but for being a brother beloved. I will not hold it against you that you're still a member of Omega Psi Phi fraternity. I know you pledged it for life, but if you ever want to take up your reconsideration of that mistake you made, I'll be glad to cross you across the burning sands of Cap Alpha Psi. Listen, I know that we can't be together in that sacred space of Rankin Chapel to be together in worship, but I'm thankful for the opportunity to share in the word nonetheless. We live in the midst of a time when I believe God requires and demands that God's children raise their voices, that we speak out against the injustice that we see both systemically and individually, that we realize that God has given us the gift of influence, that God has called us to wherever we are for such a time as this. Prayerfully, those words echo with you. It's what Mordecai told Esther, and it's what God has placed on my heart to share with you all on this day of worship. As we look at Esther, I simply want to remind you it's your time. I pray that you're blessed by this word from the Lord. I want to first invite you to hear the call of Esther. The book of Esther, if you will, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 King, 1 and 2 Chronicle, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. If you will turn with me to the fourth chapter of the book of Esther, I would encourage you to read all 10 chapters to lay a foundation for the word today and the next few Sundays. But won't you hear the reading of the word of God from Esther chapter 4, beginning in verse number 12, as I read out of the New International Version of God's word. Esther chapter 4, beginning in verse number 12. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer to her. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days or night. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Do me a favor, if you don't mind finding someone around you or texting someone you can reach out to and simply tell them, it's your time. It's your time. One of the duties I believe God continuously calls us to is the use of our voice and our presence not only to spread the gospel in the world, but to speak against the evil that runs rampant in our land. That one of the primary calls upon each Christian life is to know and to discern when to use our voice and our presence to not only spread the gospel, but to speak against the evil that runs rampant in our land. Too often, evil prospers because we devalue and underestimate the value of our voice. Enough cannot be said about the power of speaking out. We hear it in cliches like silence is violence. We hear it in the Department of Homeland Security when they simply said, if you see something, say something. But I remember it most clearly in the words of Martin Luther King, who said, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. 
Dr. King acknowledged that silence does more harm than anger. Silence is more violent than rage. Silence is more destructive than vitriol. That in a real sense, silence makes you complicit with the evil. All you need to do is look at the life of Jesus. Jesus lives some 33 years and works miracles unseen, heals the sick, raises the dead, sight to the blind, feeds 5,000. And yet on his last day, as he stands in front of the Sanhedrin council, with Pilate asking, what shall I do? The Sanhedrin council had paid a handful of people to holler crucify him. And even though there was a small crowd hollering crucify him, where was the large crowd to raise their voice who knew that Jesus was innocent? Where was the woman with the issue of blood? Where was Lazarus? Where was a centurion's son? Where were the 5,000 who were fed in the wilderness? 5,000 people should have been there raising their voice, proclaiming the innocence of Jesus. And yet, the silence of the supporters became complicit in his crucifixion. Silence does damage. I would argue, my brother and my sister, that although many of us may never be called to preach, you may never be called to stand in a pulpit and declare the word of God. You may never preach a sermon. You may never pastor a church. You may never be called to preach. But at some moment in your life, you will be called to be a prophet. Every child of God reaches a space where God expects you to be God's voice where God wants to use you and your presence and your mouth and your words to not only declare his goodness, but to speak against an evil and an oppression that is contrary to the will of God. Beloved, any life led by God will eventually reach a place where silence is not acceptable. You will reach a place where the Lord is calling you to your Christian duty to come out of the shadows of anonymity, to no longer be complicit through your silence, but to stand up and be that which Christ declared we ought to be, the light of the world, a city that cannot be hidden, that God creates seasons and opportunities where the call of duty for the child of God is to raise your voice, to speak your peace, to open your mouth, and to declare that which is not in accordance with the will of God. That call to duty to speak is clearly seen in the life of a bad sister in the Bible named Esther. I'm going to encourage you to reread the book of Esther during your devotional time this week. It's only 10 chapters. You can read it in one hour. It will bless your life. The book of Esther. Let me teach you a little Bible before we get into the sermon. The book of Esther is one of the most controversial and yet most popular books in all the Bible. It's controversial, and it's popular. The book of Esther is controversial because you may not know this. It is the only book in all the Bible to make no mention of God. In all 10 chapters of Esther, there's no mention of God. There's no calling on God. There's no referral to God. There's no allusion to God. As a matter of fact, Esther is so controversial because God is seemingly absent from the book of Esther from beginning to end. There's seemingly no God in the book of Esther. But the book of Esther is also popular among the Jews because the events in the book of Esther lay the foundation for one of the most festive Jewish holidays. Go on, teach Pastor Wesley. The book of Esther gives us the foundation of the events that lay the foundation for the Jewish feast and holiday called Purim. Purim is the Jewish celebration of their deliverance from the genocidal plan 
that is put in motion in the book of Esther. <laughs> Let me give you a little background so you don't miss the breakdown, a little context so you can appreciate the content. After the Babylonians and Nebuchadnezzar, who destroyed Jerusalem, come the Persians. And the book of Esther is situated during the reign of the Persian emperor Ahasuerus, who's also known as Xerxes, who rules from 486 to 464 BC. The events of the book of Esther really revolve around five key people. Xerxes, Haman, Mordecai, Vashti, and Esther. The book of Esther revolves around five critical people. Xerxes, Haman, Vashti, Mordecai, and Esther. Xerxes is the emperor. And Xerxes makes the mistake of promoting a narcissistic general by the name of Haman. He promotes Haman to the office of vizier, which is a high-ranking official in his, emperor, in his empire. Haman is narcissistic. Haman wants everybody to bow before him. Haman believes he's the best vizier that the nation has ever had. Haman fires anybody who doesn't agree with him. Haman uses his own power to pardon his friends while not demanding justice across the land. Haman doesn't support the life and liberty of anybody who doesn't look like him, who doesn't believe like him, who doesn't take what he says as honest to God truth. Haman is narcissistic. And Haman is offended when he meets a brother by the name of Mordecai. Mordecai is a Jew who's been exiled and now lives in the diaspora of the Persian Empire. Mordecai is raising because he's adopted his cousin whose name is Hadassah, but you better know her as Esther. Haman runs up on Mordecai one day, and Haman demands that Mordecai bows down. Haman demands that Mordecai recognizes his superiority. Haman demands that Mordecai stay in his place. And Mordecai's response to Haman, in the Howard John Wesley translation of the Bible, Mordecai tells Haman, you got the right one today. Now allow me to speak to those and teach those who are not versed in the idiomatic subtleties of African-American linguistics, that if you ever meet an African-American who says to you, you got the right one, trust me, you do not. When an African-American tells you, you got the right one, they're letting you know you just picked the wrong one. You just picked someone who's not going to sit by and let you talk to me any old way. You just found someone who's not afraid to open their mouths and teach you a little something, something. You just found someone who knows how to use their voice and declare what should and should not be. You're not going to call me out my name. You're not going to treat me like I'm less than. I will not protect your privilege. I am not inferior to you. When you got the right one, you found someone who's about to open their mouth. Mordecai lets Haman know, brother, you got the right one. I do not acknowledge your superiority. I will not bow before you. As a matter of fact, your flag got to come down. Your name has to be erased. Our history must be rewritten. I will not bow down to you. Haman is so upset that he wants Mordecai killed. No, he doesn't just want Mordecai killed. Watch this. He wants all the Jews to be killed. Because of Mordecai, Haman devises a genocidal plot to kill all the Jews in the Persian Empire on one day. Haman goes to Xerxes and makes the request for all the Jews to be killed. And Xerxes says yes. 
And it happens just like that. In the blink of an eye, an entire nation of people are at threat. Xerxes says yes. The Senate refuses to hear witnesses. Haman's base gets riled up. Supremacy and hatred groups are formed. And when the Jews push back and holler, Jewish lives matter, they are met with the ignorance of the Persians who holler, all lives matter. And just like that, Persian officers are allowed to put their necks, their knees on the necks of those who are already handcuffed in custody. And just like that, they're able to film their hunting down and killing of Jews who are jogging in their neighborhood and are not even arrested. And just like that, they can shoot into the bedroom of a sleeping sister and shoot her eight times and nobody be arrested. Just like that, there's a plot and a plan to kill them. There's a plot and a plan to kill them financially with economic policies that are slighted against them, to kill them educationally with underfunded and undersupplied schools, to kill them physically without granting access to health care and forcing them to live in ghetto food deserts, a plan to kill them mentally by asserting their privilege and assuming their superiority and calling them the N-word, I mean the J-word, just like that. There's a plan to kill them. And what must be dealt with is not just the plan to kill them, but all the spirit underneath it. The legalized injustice, the systemic racism, the historic oppression. What must be dealt with is not just Haman, but the spirit of Haman that is now floating through the empire. It's the spirit of Haman that must be dealt with. It's the philosophy of racial superiority. It's the ideology of privilege. It's the conscience of a nation that must be awakened. It's the heart of a people that must be changed. It's not just Haman. It's his spirit that must be dealt with. And when the spirit of Haman must be dealt with, God shows up. Now, now, if you're still listening, you should be pushing back right here and saying, Pastor, I thought you said God was not in the book of Esther. No, I said God wasn't mentioned in the book of Esther. But just because God is not mentioned <laughs> does not mean that God is not at work. Go on and let me say that again. Just because God is not mentioned does not mean that God is not at work. Because when the hand of God is not seen, when the name of God is not called, when the miracles of God are not experienced, when the worship of God is not regular, God is still at work by those whom God calls into duty to use their voice and speak on his behalf that even when it seems that God is nowhere to be found, God shows up in the voice of those who are called to speak on behalf of the Lord. And one person who's called to represent God and fight the spirit of Haman is Esther. Esther's call is to speak on behalf of her people. Let's talk about Esther for a little bit. Esther, in all the Persian Empire, Mark, is uniquely positioned to do what nobody else can do. Esther is the queen. And when the plot to kill the Jews comes, Mordecai tells Esther, you got to use your position because Esther can get into the throne room. Esther can talk to the emperor. Esther can get his ear because she holds his heart. Esther has access to Xerxes. But when Mordecai tells Esther she needs to go to Xerxes, Esther is not only hesitant, Esther is unwilling. She's been queen for five years. 
She knows palace protocol. And she says that if I go to Xerxes and he does not call for me, palace protocol says anybody who goes to the emperor without being summoned is immediately put to death. And Esther does not want to go because she fears she's going to be killed. Beloved, what we see in Esther is what we experience too often in the world today. People who are hesitant and unwilling to use their position and their influence to change the system. People who are afraid to raise their voices and become complicit in the evil in the land. I had to sit back and wonder, what makes Esther hesitant? What makes Esther unwilling? Why is Esther unwilling to go and use her position to save her people? Why is her initial response, I'm not going to do that? If you allow me to teach a little Bible and share with you what's on my mind and in my heart, I would suggest to you that there are three problems that Esther's dealing with, and they're the same three that hinder many of us from our call to duty to use our voice in this time in which we live. Can I share with you three problems Esther has, and maybe one of them affects you? Here's the first problem. The reason Esther is hesitant and unwilling. Number one, Esther misunderstands the purpose of favor. Esther misunderstands the purpose of favor. Esther is queen. And what I want you to ask yourself is this. How does Esther get to be queen? How does she come to occupy that seat? Well, you got to go back to chapter 1 and know about her predecessor named Vashti. And Vashti is thrown off of her kingdom as queen because she disobeyed the emperor. And when Vashti is no longer queen, a search goes out to find the next queen, and the next queen is Esther. Now, what you ought to be asking is how is it that Esther is chosen over all the women in the Persian Empire? B beloved, it, it makes sense for Vashti to be queen. You know why? Vashti is the granddaughter of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, the former emperor, his granddaughter is Vashti or Vashti, so it seems that Xerxes has married her out of a political allegiance, and so now there's a queen who's got royal blood. I can understand Vashti being queen because she is the granddaughter of an emperor. But I would suggest to you that Esther has no business being queen. Esther is a Jew which means she's an outsider and an immigrant. She's not been raised in private Persian schools. She's not been groomed in proper protocol of the emperor. And not only is she a Jew, but she's an orphan. She's not connected to a wealthy family. She doesn't have connections in the empire. As a matter of fact, when the application goes out to be queen, she doesn't even know anybody to write her letter of recommendation. There is nothing on Esther's resume that demands she be royal. So how does Esther get to be queen? Even though there's nothing on her resume, what allows Esther to be queen, watch this, is because Xerxes identifies that she is more beautiful than any woman in the entire land. When Xerxes looks at Esther, he says, now that's a bad mamma jamma. When Xerxes looks at Esther, he sees something and someone that is beautiful in his eyes. Now, now, now beloved, beloved, let, 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 let us never reduce a woman to lips, hips, and fingertips. But I would argue with you, that there is nothing on Esther's resume other than her beauty. And in that day and age, 
when there were no medical beautiful enhancements to be had, that Esther is just naturally beautiful in Xerxes' eyes, which means that her beauty is what God shaped her with. So the only thing that opened the door for her to be queen was what God had given her. That the only reason Esther is queen is because God has favored her with beauty that Xerxes recognizes and Xerxes respects. The only reason Esther is queen is because of the favor of God. And I don't know who I came to preach to over this weekend, but every now and then you need to recognize when you have landed in a space and a place where the only reason you are there is the grace of God. The only reason you sit where you sit is God favored you. The only reason you work where you work is because God opened a door that your resume could not open. The only reason you got what you have is because God looked at you and in spite of what you were not, God made a way for you. Is there anybody watching this sermon who can declare that if it were not for the grace of God and the favor of God and God doing for me what I couldn't do for myself, I would not have anything at all. But beloved, I, I know you think highly of yourself, and I know there's some of you who think you made it all the way up the ladder, so I'm not preaching to you. I want to preach to someone today who every now and then I want you to perform some simple mathematics. It's real simple. The next time you begin to think about God, I want you to make a list of all the things God's done for you. I want you to make a list of all the things you have, all the things you cherish, all the things you value, all the people you love, all the opportunities you've been given, all the blessings you walk in. And then I want you to make another list. I want you to make a list of everything you know you ain't, every mistake you've made, every fault you've had, every failure in your life, every sin you've ever committed, every time you've ever done wrong. I want you to make two lists a list of the blessing of God, and a list of your own faults and failures. And I want you to perform a mathematical equation. It's called subtraction. For those who don't remember, the list of what you take from is called the menu end. The menu end is what you have. Uh, the subtrahend is what you're subtracting. So you take the menu end, and you remove the subtrahend, and what you're left with is the difference. <laughs> Don't you miss this. The menu end is what you have. The subtrahend is what you're taking away, and what you're left with is the difference. And so if you take what God has blessed you with and subtract what you are not, all you have left is the favor of God, and that's the difference. I came by to declare to somebody that the favor of God has made all the difference in your life. The favor of God has opened doors for you. The favor of God has put you in places you could not get by yourself. Is there anybody here who knows about the favor of God? The favor of God has put Esther in her throne. But the problem with Esther is the same problem with many of us who are the recipients of favor. Favor is not simply meant to bless you. Favor is meant to position you. Favor is not simply a blessing. Favor is a positioning that when God favors you, God is literally trying to put you in a place where you can be ready for when God needs you and when, when God wants to use you. Favor is not you being able to sit and pat yourself on the back and say, look what I wear, look what I drive, look where I live, look how much I earn. No, when you recognize that God has favored you, you need to also recognize that God has positioned you so that God can use you. You know what favor is? Favor is like playing chess. That anyone who really knows how to play chess knows that you don't wait for your opponent to make a move and respond. 
That when you are strategic, you put your pieces in the right place so that when your enemy does respond, you've already got something there to counteract so you can still win. You don't wait for the enemy. You position in ahead of time so that when the enemy makes his move, you've already got a piece in place. I don't know who I'm preaching to today, but when God favored you, when God opened a door for you, when God blessed you the way God did, God was putting you in place so that when the enemy made his next move, move. God already had a brother. God already had a sister whom God could use. So the next time you want to shout about favor, remember this. Favor is always a precursor to the fight. Favor is a precursor to a fight. That when God blesses you, you ain't got but a short season to wave hands and say amen and say thank you. Because sooner or later, you will discover that God put you there to get ready for a fight God's going to put you in. So I come by to tell you that if you are the recipient of favor, you have an obligation to be used by God in a fight that's coming your way. Esther's silent because she misunderstands the purpose of favor. Can I give you another reason why I think Esther's silent? I believe Esther's silent because like many of us, watch this, Esther is afraid of conflict. Esther doesn't want to get involved in anything ugly. She's seen what happened with Mordecai and Haman. She saw how ugly things got with Vashti. She knows palace protocol and knows that she'll be killed if she goes in. And I believe Esther says to herself what many of us say to talk ourselves out of our call to duty. Eh, I, I don't want to cause any trouble. I don't want to get anybody in any hot water. I don't want to cause any mess. I don't want there to be any drama. I just want there to be peace. I want everybody to get along. I, I, don't, I don't want to be a stick in the mud. I don't want people not to like me. I don't want anything bad to happen. I don't want drama. I don't do ugly. That's not my personality. That's not my character. And too many people talk themselves out of God's call because you're afraid of conflict. Now, now, the problem with that spirit, Esther, is that you are predicting conflict before it happens. The problem is that you've assumed the only way to change the system is to get ugly. You've assumed that confrontation must also be conflictual. You've made the assumption that it's got to be dramatic in order to change. And if you assume that the only way to change a system is through controversy, conflict and confrontation, you will always talk yourself out of your call. Let me say that again. If you assume that the only way to change a system is through conflict, controversy, and confrontation, you will always talk yourself out of your call. That's why I want you to go back and read the book of Esther. Because when you read the entire book of Esther, you will find out that in chapter 5 and chapter 6, Esther devises a strategic plan to influence Xerxes to save her people with no confrontation. Esther devises a strategic plan that requires no conflict. Esther devises a strategic plan that doesn't require any ugly, any drama, any mess, any nasty, any vulgarity. Watch this. Esther uses her wisdom because those whom God has favored God has also gifted with wisdom. I need to say that again, that God does not place favor on those whom God has not also granted wisdom. God has not put you in your position to act out of anger. God has put you in your position to learn how to act out of wisdom. Go on and say that again, Pastor. God favors you and positions you so that you can use the wisdom God has given you. I come by to tell you, anybody can act in anger. Anybody can burn it down. Anybody can act a fool, but very rarely does that change anything. 
Beloved, burning something down does not change the heart of a nation. Cussing somebody out is not going to make the relationship any better. Acting a fool may make you feel better, but it's not going to change the system you are in. Jesus put it like this. I need you in the situations you go through to be as wise as serpents, but as harmless as a dove. I need you to act in wisdom and not in anger. I need you to act in intelligence and not in foolishness. Why? Watch this. Because the only thing that challenges white privilege is black intelligence. Ha! Go and say that, Pastor. The only thing that challenges white privilege is black intelligence. They don't know what to do with a brother whose subject matches his verbs. They don't know what to do with a sister who can quote Toni Morrison and Ralph Emerson. They don't know what to do with a brother who knows his legal and his constitutional rights. They don't know what to do with a sister who is eloquent and loquacious. They don't know what to do with somebody that can cuss them out with words they gotta look up in the dictionary. They don't know how to handle black intelligence which is why in the heart of racism in the history of the United States of America our forefathers and our foremothers knew the need for historically black colleges and universities because they knew that if we educated our young people, we knew that if we gave them the right vocabulary, we knew if we gave them intelligence in their hands, we knew that if we taught them to rise above ignorance, that the intelligence of a black woman and a black man is the only threat to white privilege. And I come by to talk to someone today. I need you to be wise. I'm asking you to operate in intelligence and not ignorance. I'm asking you to move in wisdom and not foolishness. Esther misunderstands the purpose of favor. Esther is afraid of conflict. But let me give you this third thing that I think affects Esther that affects many of us. Esther lacks the courage to lose her position in order to secure someone's protection. Esther lacks the courage to risk her position in order to secure someone else's protection. W w watch, watch the fallacy of Esther's argument. She says to Mordecai, I can't go because I'll be killed. She knows that's not true. How does she know? Not simply because she's the queen and not simply because she's beautiful and not simply because Xerxes loves her, but also because of Vashti. Remember, Vashti disobeyed the emperor and lived. So you can disobey the emperor's command and still live, Esther. You know that from Vashti. But what you also saw was that Vashti lost her position. And I'll suggest to you that at the heart of Esther's reluctance is not a fear of death. It's a fear of losing her position. And what hinders so many people from rising to their call of duty of the Lord is an unwillingness to risk the very position God gave you in order to secure someone else's protection. I don't know who I'm preaching to right now, but I want to make sure you catch this. The Lord favors you and positions you so that you can protect the system from hurting someone else. God literally places you where you are so that you become a shield for those who are behind you so that the harm that others have experienced, they won't, even if it means you've got to risk your own position. The question Esther has to ask is the same question each and every one of us does. Am I willing to save my position while others lose their lives? Or am I willing to lose my position so others can save their lives? Do I want to live with my position knowing that others have been damaged? Or am I willing to risk my position knowing that others have been protected? Can I live with knowing that because I said nothing, somebody lost everything? Can I live knowing that because I didn't step up, someone got shot down? Can I live knowing that because I kept quiet with what happened to me, I allowed it to happen to someone else. 
Can I live with the fact that if I had just said that's not right, then somebody may not have experienced what I knew to be wrong? Can you live with the fact that you chose your position over somebody else's protection? I came by to declare to you in the end of this message that if you are a true child of God, there's going to be a moment in your life where you've got to exhibit some courage, where you've got to lay it all on the line, where you've got to risk your position, where you've got to sacrifice for others, where you've got to speak up, where you've got to say like Esther said, if I die, I die. Listen at Esther at the end of this, making the declaration, yes, I've got position, but you know what? I'm going to lay it all on the line for my people, and if I die, I die. If I lose, I lose. If they lay me off, they lay me off. If they don't like me, they don't like me. If they don't want to talk to me no more, they don't have to talk to me no more. If they don't want to be my friend, they don't have to be my friend, but what I'm not going to do is live in this position knowing that because of me, somebody else suffered. Because of me, somebody else had to endure wrong. Because of me, somebody else was done unjustly. I have an opportunity to speak up and protect somebody else. And whatever it costs me, it's going to cost me. I believe that Esther found courage in the same space that you can find courage. Faith. Courage is easy when you have faith. Faith says this, that if God put me there, God can put me somewhere else. Faith says this, that if God opened the door once, God can open it again. Faith declares that no matter what happens to me, God will fight my battle. Faith declares that if I lose some friends, God's got somebody else to add. Faith believes that God is going to fight. God's going to move. God's going to do something that if I do what God has called me to do, God will take care of me. That, beloved, is the essence of the hymn by Sister C.D. Martin, that hymnologist who wrote the words of the blood will never lose its power. That hymnologist who wrote, my, his eye is on the sparrow. Her first hymn in 1904 says this, be not dismayed, whatever be tied, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. God will take care of you in every way or all the way. He will take care of you, God will take care of you. And Esther, I just want to speak into your life today that you've got a call to duty. I don't want you to misunderstand favor. God has positioned you. I don't want you to be afraid of conflict because God's giving you wisdom. And beloved, I don't want you to lack the courage to risk your position when your risk could save someone else and God will take care of you. I don't I don't mind waiting. I don't mind waiting on the Lord. I don't mind.
What an incredible message. Though the physical doors of the chapel are closed, the chapel remains open and vibrant as we continue to support the Howard University community. Members of our chapel staff and our chaplains are still holding virtual office hours, and our students from various chapel organizations and initiatives still meet virtually in the name of faith, service, and justice. We need your financial contributions. To support the ministry of the chapel, simply visit our website, chapel.howard.edu. There you will find a give link. In this time of uncertainty, never forget the power of prayer. You may submit prayer requests via the chapel website as well. We are incredibly excited for the Student Leader Commissioning Service, which will be held Sunday, September 27th. This virtual service aims to unite the entire Howard University community for a time of prayer and encouragement for our students in leadership across the university as they accept the responsibility and into the legacy of Howard University student leadership. To stay up to date on that service and all things chapel, follow us on social media, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook with the handle at Howard U Chapel. Take a moment even now and subscribe to our YouTube page. Lastly, we would love if you would share your worship experience with us using the hashtag Sundays are for chapel. We now welcome Dean Richardson who will lead us in our benediction. We thank you, Pastor Wesley, for that very powerful and moving message. And now I said to the one who stood at the gate, give me a light that I may go out into the darkness and into the unknown. And she replied to me, go out into the darkness, go out into the unknown, but put your hand in the hand of God and God shall be for you better than light and much safer than a known way. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace, both now and forevermore. Amen.